iceberg right ahead. The call comes too late. It's every seafarer's worst nightmare. The hull is breached and the ship's going down. Your vessel is now vertical and it's sinking fast. You've scrambled to the very tip of the stern, avoiding the inevitable plunge for as long as you can. But the ship's still descending. You brace yourself for the ice cold waters when you suddenly remember that the one place you must avoid is just above the sinking wreck. Eyewitness accounts from the Titanic recall a kind of suction effect, whereby the plummeting colossus generated pull that dragged down anything in its wake. But are these accounts reliable? What's the science behind the theory? And if correct, what does that mean for surviving a sinking ship? I'm Stu, this is Debunked, and we're here to sort the truths from the myths, and the facts from the misconceptions. Before we address the specifics of a sinking ship, it's a good idea to try and get a handle on why something floats in the first place. Obviously, all objects with mass are acted upon by gravity. Our weight, body mass multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity, is a force that acts downwards towards the centre of the Earth. It keeps us rooted to the Earth's surface and causes us to plummet from the top diving board and sink into water. An object floats on water when there is a big enough force acting in the opposite direction to its weight. This is known as buoyant force, and buoyancy is all about displacing water. Think about the last time you had a bath. You might have noticed that the water level rose as you lowered yourself into the warm water. The reason for this is that your body now occupies space that was previously occupied by the bath water. Water is extremely difficult to compress, so when you lower yourself onto it, you don't squash it. You essentially push it out of the way. All that water has to go somewhere, and as it's confined in every other direction by the sides of the bath, the only way is up. Let's imagine for the sake of simplicity that your bathtub is perfectly rectangular. If you could measure the water level rise with a ruler and multiply it by the length and width of the bathtub, you would get a number that corresponds precisely to the total volume of all the parts of your body that are under the water. Now, Archimedes' principle tells us that An object submerged in a fluid experiences an upward force equal to the weight of the fluid it displaces. If we multiply the volume we're talking about by the density of water, we get our buoyant force. So, what determines whether an object's buoyant force is able to keep it afloat? In a word, density. If it's more dense than water, then its weight will exceed the buoyant force acting on it, and it will sink. Though the hull of a ship is typically made of steel, which is obviously considerably more dense than water, a vast amount of its internal space is empty, except for air. Thus, the ship is, on average, less dense than water. When a ship makes a transition from land to sea, its hull sinks below the surface of the ocean until it has displaced a quantity of water equal to its own weight. At this point, the downward force of its weight and the buoyant force acting upwards are equal, and it floats. How then does a ship come to sink? Let's set sail on the SS Debunked and see how we fare. Our ship will sit happily on the sea surface for as long as its average density remains lower than that of seawater. If you keep adding heavy cargo until the average density of the ship exceeds that of seawater though, there's no escaping the inevitable. An opening in the ship, or the whole deck, will eventually drop below the waterline. The air-filled spaces that previously helped to keep its density sufficiently low begin to fill with water, and the only way is down. Another route to the bottom is via a hull breach. If an object breaks through an already submerged part of the ship, water starts to flood in. Depending on the extent of the damage and the vessel's construction, it still might be able to stay afloat. Once it reaches the point that weight exceeds buoyant force though, it's all over. Of course, if a ship rolls over, capsizing, water can rush into its openings very quickly, leading to a dramatic and sudden sinking event. This is the leading cause of fatalities on smaller boats. And while rare for larger vessels, when it does happen on huge ships, the results can be catastrophic. OK, so we've established how floating works and what causes a boat to sink. Let's have a look at the physics of the fallout and how it might affect our hero. 
VSS debunked is sinking. As it plummets, water rushes past the hull, and friction between the water and the ship's surface creates drag forces. These interactions, which are most pronounced at protrusions, corners, and irregular contours of the ship's architecture, cause abrupt changes in the water's flow speed and direction, introducing pockets of high and low pressure. The result is swirling pockets of turbulence and vortex formation. While some of the vortices and their associated currents might tug a person on the surface downwards, there will also be currents acting in many other directions. Rather than a singular downward pull, turbulence manifests more like choppiness, chaotic movement in several directions that might be destabilizing, and could even drag you under momentarily, but won't typically suck you down into the depths. That said, drag forces aren't the only dynamic at play here. As a ship sinks, water will rush in through any openings into the air-filled parts of the boat's interior. To explain why this happens, it's useful to understand the concept of hydrostatic pressure. But before we get into that, we've all been there, treading water in our career for too long, struggling to maximize our potential. Hop on board strawberry.me, and they can help you set your career sailing again with a career coach. Once you've completed a short onboarding quiz, strawberry.me will match you with your personal career coach, an expert who can help you work out your next career move. Whether that's building on your current role or looking to change your career entirely, your coach will help build a strategy to get you to where you want to be. And if you don't know where that is right now, perhaps you're stuck in a job, have been overlooked for a promotion, or having job search frustration, then they can work with you to figure out what actions you need to take to build a more fulfilling career. For me, it feels a bit like therapy for your career. I came away from my session feeling pretty psyched. One of the key pieces of guidance my coach set out for me was to ensure I made myself accountable in order to achieve the goals we set out, and build in ways that mean we can measure the results. All coaches are committed to helping you grow in a structured and creative way. Maximize your potential by visiting strawberry.me forward slash debunked or scan the QR code on screen now and get a $50 credit to start coaching with a career expert. Right, let's get back to our current predicament. Hydrostatic pressure is the pressure exerted by a fluid due to the weight of water above that point. The deeper you sink into the ocean, the more the hydrostatic pressure increases. The air inside the ship, however, remains at roughly atmospheric pressure. So there is a significant difference between the pressure exerted by the seawater and the pressure of the air inside the ship. All fluids tend to flow from regions of high pressure to regions of low pressure, and seawater is no exception. Any openings in the ship will provide an opportunity for it to rush in and fill the void. In this scene, some of the windows sit only partly below the waterline, but this shallow layer of water piles on enough weight to push the hydrostatic pressure beyond what the glass can handle. The icy seawater rushes in and under the force of gravity plummets down into the ship like an indoor waterfall. The powerful current associated with this cascade drags hapless passengers through the openings and deeper into the stricken ship. This scenario, a torrent of water pulling you over over the edge to your certain fate is more or less what would happen if you stood at the top of a real-life regular outdoor waterfall. But what would it look like if you, the cavity and the opening were all completely submerged? If by some extraordinary bout of misfortune you were in the water next to the ship as part of the ship's structure suddenly imploded under the pressure, exposing an air-filled cavity to the open ocean, it's not inconceivable that you could be drawn in. Rapidly flooding compartments could generate temporary but strong currents, briefly pulling in nearby objects, including unlucky swimmers, before turbulence takes over. While this kind of scenario could in theory give rise to a strong pull with a clear direction, it wouldn't last. As the pressure difference moves towards equilibrium, the pull would weaken, and the chaotic conditions of the sinking event would ensure that even a well-defined initial pull would quickly dissipate into turbulent multi-directional currents. If you are unfortunate enough to be near an opening when water rushes in to fill a large cavity, and if the current is strong enough to drag you in with it, then your chances of escaping the ship afterwards are pretty slim. No one who was in the grand staircase of the Titanic at the time it began to flood is known to have survived. There is one fascinating and potentially hazardous aspect of a sinking event that we're yet to attend to. 
As all this water rushes into the air-filled cavities, the air is displaced by the water, meaning that it is forced out of the ship and will rise to the surface in the form of bubbles. So, how will these air bubbles affect a person at the surface? It turns out this is a more contentious issue than you might think. Because air is less dense than water, water that is aerated, full of bubbles, has a lower average density than just plain old water. And the bubblier it gets, the more its average density decreases. The big question is, could air bubbles reduce the density of water to the extent that a floating person could plummet below the surface never to be seen again? It turns out that there's another altogether less dramatic scenario where this question has been pondered quite a bit. Sewage treatment plants. Without going into too much technical or unsavoury detail, the big pools of brown water at these facilities need to be vigorously aerated as part of the process of cleaning them up. They do this essentially by blowing bubbles up from the bottom of the tank. The idea that aerated water is dangerous is taken so seriously that tanks like this tend to carry dire warnings to would-be wallowers, warning them that the water is essentially unswimmable, and that taking the plunge carries a distinct risk of drowning. It's not totally clear, though, whether this is actually true. In the mid-1980s, Patrick L. Stevens of the Indianapolis Department of Public Works thought enough of the speculation and decided to take the plunge. In his 1985 paper, titled Falling into an aeration tank, do you sink or swim? He presented his calculations as an account of his dip into a test tank. That is, the kind of tank that would be used to treat sewage, but filled with water, rather than human waste. He found that the aerated water would result in a decrease in buoyancy of about 1.6%, meaning a person of his size, under the test conditions, would sink about two inches further into the water. Hardly a terrifying descent. He was careful to note that although the aeration of the water reduced its density, leading to a sinking effect, the upward movement of the bubbles actually counteracted this effect slightly, providing a small but probably significant push in the direction of the surface. Ultimately, Stevens concluded that it was the strong currents at the edge of the tanks that were pulling people under the water, not the reduced density due to the bubbles. It's conceivable that very large bubbles from an enormous sinking ship would produce a more significant aeration effect, but unlike the sewage treatment tank, the bubbling would not be continuous. Once the air has rushed out of the ship, the aeration would cease. The seawater would return to its previous density, and any object in said water, human or otherwise, less dense than the seawater, would float back to the surface. In light of our scientific overview, then, it looks like the mega-suction effect associated with sinking ships is a myth, albeit one grounded in a misunderstanding of some quite complex but very real fluid dynamics. If the science suggests there's no suction effect, then why are there numerous survivor reports of being drawn under by the sinking Titanic's suction? Well, this also seems to be a misconception. The notion that the Titanic created suction as it went down was explored repeatedly during the official British and US inquiries that followed the Titanic disaster, where it came to light that the primary source of this idea was actually witnesses who were already in the lifeboats that moved away from the Titanic for fear of being sucked down, not from those who actually experienced the suction effect themselves. Look out George Simmons, Lifeboat One. After I saw that the ship was doomed, I gave the order to pull a little further and so escape the suction. Fireman Stoker George Bocamp, Lifeboat 13. We pulled on our oars again then and pulled further away because of the suction of the ship. By contrast, those that were near the Titanic, or actually in the water as the ship went down, reported quite the opposite. US Senator William Alden Smith, who chaired the US inquiry, questioned, And was there any noticeable suction? Titanic steward Alfred Crawford. No, sir. Titanic able seaman Frank Osman. There was no suction whatever. Titanic wireless operator Harold Bride. I was swimming when she went down, and I felt practically no suction at all. Colonel Archibald Gracie's detailed observations have proved instrumental in understanding the final moments of the Titanic disaster. Gracie went down with the ship, clinging onto a rail. Senator Smith. I would like to know specifically whether, while this ship was sinking and you were in close proximity to it, you noticed any special suction. 
Colonel Gracie. No, I noticed no suction, and I did not go down so far as that it would affect my nose or my ears. Senators questioned multiple witnesses about the presence of suction, with Senator Smith stating, There has been an impression that a sinking ship by the suction as it goes down will draw into the vortex quite largely from the surface of the surrounding sea. That theory seems to have been exploded by the sinking of the Titanic, because every officer thus far has said that there was no suction. There are two survivors, however, that initially went down with the ship that did report being sucked down, albeit for a brief moment. Boiler room trimmer Thomas Patrick Dillon testified that he went down with the ship and was sucked down two fathoms, around 12 feet or 3.5 meters. He then pushed himself away from the sinking ship and seemed to get lifted up to the surface. Second officer Charles Lightoller also described being sucked down, but he himself explains that this was due to water rushing into the ship through a grate. It was against this grating that I was sucked by the water and held there. Lightoller was briefly trapped underwater, but was then freed to the surface. There was a terrific blast of air and water, and I was blown out clear. We can only make an educated guess here, based on our survey of the science. But if we examine the case of Charles Lightoller, his testimony aligns with the currents we described earlier, pulling a person underwater as cavities in the ship fill with water. Once the cavity behind the grate he was trapped against had filled with water, there would no longer be a sufficient difference in pressure between the cavity and the open sea, and the current that was pulling him towards the ship would essentially die out. At this point, the additional buoyancy provided by his life jacket, plus potentially a bit of uplift from rising air bubbles, as described in the sewage tank experiment, could result in a feeling of being blown out towards the ocean surface. It's difficult, of course, to know exactly what happened in terms of the physics. Apart from anything else, a person's account of their own experiences in such a traumatic scenario are unlikely to be scientifically precise and may not even be broadly accurate with some accounts directly contradicting others. Returning to the wreck of the SS Debunk then, does all this mean that it's pretty much safe to float directly above a sinking ship as it's sinking? Not really. The turbulence and aeration effects we've detailed might not result in a singular and continuous downward suck, but clearly, in the immediate aftermath of sinking, the water was chaotic and unstable, and the currents they experienced were almost strong enough to drown those who ultimately managed to survive to provide us with these famous eyewitness accounts. Furthermore, in a sinking event of this magnitude, there's a very real danger of being caught in a loose part of the descending vessel. In addition, there's a real risk of being hit by a less dense part of the ship after it breaks away from the wreck, which would rise rapidly to the surface and could strike a floating survivor with considerable force. So what should you do? If you're stranded in open water without a flotation aid, conserve energy by floating instead of swimming or treading water. In calm conditions, lie on your back with ears submerged, limbs spread, and gently move your arms to stay balanced. In rough water, use a face-down position with chin tucked, arms extended, and legs relaxed, surface only to breathe. This method saves more energy but requires practice in a safe setting. Oh, and as a final note, if you're about to embark on an ocean crossing and you happen to see this man anywhere on board, ask if you can take the next boat. Thanks for watching. Remember to check out strawberry.me to discover your potential. And if you haven't already, then please subscribe to make sure you don't miss our next episode. Stay curious, and we'll see you next time.